All right, uh, so we're going to start the lecture today discussing uh, small molecule transport in heterogeneous material. And this topic has been of importance for, um, for a long time in applications like uh, uh, drying of textiles or leather drying, um, the uh, migration of small molecules in semi-crystalline polymers, any uh, application where a material is not homogeneous or doesn't appear to be homogeneous from a transport point of view. And so this can be, uh, for example, uh, crystalline regions in a semi-crystalline polymer are impermeable, but the amorphous region surrounding these crystalline regions uh, typically is not impermeable. And so uh, penetrant molecules that are uh, that are diffusing under a concentration gradient through uh, such a uh, such an environment will uh, uh, have to go around those uh, those crystalline uh, regions, and so the transport uh, equations are modified as a result of the structural heterogeneities in the uh, in the material. The uh, this topic has taken on a uh, an increasingly important um, role in the field of membrane science as uh, there has been in the past uh, uh, 20 years and, and to a greater extent in the last 10 or even 5 years uh, a lot of effort uh, aimed at, uh, uh, at studying the effect of uh, nanofillers, uh, things like graphene oxide, carbon nanotubes, zeolites, uh, metal organic frameworks, uh, etc. Um, the effect of these types of nanomaterials on transport properties through polymers, and uh, the the basic idea is that uh, uh, many uh, interesting nanomaterials uh, are are not suitable, often for mechanical reasons, of being fabricated by themselves into um, into membranes. Um, however, they may have uh, very interesting transport properties. On the other hand, uh, polymers are, uh, are easily fabricated into membranes, at least a lot of polymers are, um, but may not have the same properties as the uh, nanomaterials of interest. And so there's been a, a lot of study aimed at, uh, uh, at combining um, nanomaterials with um, uh, with polymers to make composite uh, materials that have better transport properties than uh, polymers alone um, and have uh, better uh, mechanical and processing properties than the uh, nanomaterials themselves. And so we'll talk over the next few slides about um, how one approaches modeling uh, primarily steady state uh, permeability in uh, such uh, uh, in such systems. Just by uh, way of a, a bit of background, this topic has, uh, has been of interest for a long time, as you'll see by the reference here in uh, Richard Bearer's um, chapter in John Crank's uh, book from 1968. Um, there are examples of uh, various types of uh, heterogeneous materials. You can imagine, uh, as in a, uh, a, uh, a spherical uh, filler uh, dispersed in a uh, polymer. Um, uh, aggregates of these spheres uh, in uh, chain-like or pearl necklace-like structures in, uh, in uh, figure B. Uh, this would be an example of uh, uh, something like fume silica uh, being dispersed in polymers. And then on through to uh, platelets and, and rods. Uh, clay platelets are used uh, today in, uh, uh, in plastics and some applications to improve uh, barrier properties. And uh, these types of uh, uh, inclusions in polymers uh, may be added um, to, uh, to change properties other than transport properties, uh, things like structural properties or electrical properties and optical properties and so forth. And so there, there's been a, a large interest in understanding how to describe uh, transport phenomena in such systems. Now, typically in homogeneous materials, we would 
start with uh, Fick's law to describe the uh, uh, flux of a penetrant in uh, a, uh, a direction under the influence of a concentration gradient in the uh, in the x direction, and uh, if an impermeable filler, for example, is added uh, to such a material, then uh, any penetrants that are diffusing uh, down that concentration gradient have to go around the uh, around the filler, and as a result there is a component to the flux that is not aligned with the uh, concentration gradient. And so uh, what we normally think of as Fick's Law is that a concentration gradient in one direction uh, stimulates or brings about a flux in that same direction. When the material is heterogeneous, then a flux in or a, a concentration gradient in one direction can bring about uh, a flux that is in uh, the, dir the direction of the gradient, but also uh, the directions that are perpendicular to that gradient, uh, as shown in this figure. And uh, in these cases, uh, the uh, more general version of Fick's Law uh, is shown here. And you can immediately begin to appreciate uh, the issue of uh, trying to describe at a, uh, in an analytical uh, sense transport uh, according to the uh, equations that are shown here. We have now um, uh, nine different diffusion coefficients. So if we look at the uh, first expression for uh, the flux in the x direction, um, there's diffusion coefficient that uh, uh, is basically governing the relationship between the flux in the x direction and the concentration gradient in that direction. Um, there's a different diffusion coefficient because perhaps the material heterogeneity uh, looks differently to the penetrant or presents a different resistance to mass transfer in the y direction and in the z direction. And likewise with, uh, uh, with the y and z components of the flux. And so the, the situation at a, uh, at a um, microscopic level can rapidly get uh, very complex when the material is heterogeneous. Um, and so this is not the framework uh, that's ultimately used to describe transport in such systems. So the way that um, the uh, experiments are uh, would be organized to make measurements in such systems is they would give um, essentially an average diffusion coefficient. That is, if you measured the uh, if you measured the gas flux or, or penetrant flux through this uh, material uh, from one side to the other, the flux that you would measure would reflect an average of the transport properties through the entire material, uh, through and around these uh, heterogeneities. And so uh, what's available experimentally is always some sort of average diffusion coefficient and it would depend in a complex way on uh, these diffusion coefficients in the various uh, different directions. Um, We'll start by uh, really only looking um, today at, uh, uh, at steady state transport and therefore we'll be concerned about uh, permeability coefficients primarily and we'll start to get at uh, this a bit by uh, just uh, uh, reminding uh, ourselves of uh, or, or taking as an example a uh, blend of two polymers and so uh, one might um, might mix, uh, for example, uh, two different uh, polymers that phase separate, like polymethyl and uh, and uh, polyethylene um, or uh, polyvinyl acetate, for example. Um, and we can imagine that if we make a uh, a blend of two polymers that are phase separated, then uh, the transport through that blend will reflect the uh, transport properties, uh, at the very least, of each of the individual uh, materials. And so the simplest case would be that there would be, uh, uh, that this binary blend would be phase separated and the, uh, um, the polymer components would be completely non-interacting and uh, immiscible in one another. And in this case, the solubility of penetrance in um, in such a material would just be a linear combination of the solubilities of each of the uh, of the solubilities of the penetrant in each of the pure uh, polymers, weighted by the volume fraction uh, of those 
uh, of those polymers. And uh, in cases where this uh, uh, basic uh, rule is not obeyed, this indicates uh, can often be an indicator that uh, that the components in a blend are interacting with one another. They're not completely uh, immiscible and, and uh, non-interacting. And uh, it's uh, there have been uh, because polymer blends are used in a wide variety of applications. There have been uh, many studies of transport properties in polymer blends, and often the data are found to obey a very simple uh, but uh, uh, empirical um, model that's shown in the uh, uh, in the middle of this uh, slide, and that is that the steady state permeability in the blend, the logarithm of that, is uh, given by the volume fraction weighted uh, logarithms of the uh, uh, permeabilities of each of the uh, uh, of each of the two polymers uh, in the blend. Now uh, there are uh, theoretical discussions about uh, when this law applies and uh, or this uh, empirical model applies um, and uh, one can see slight deviations away from it but often this would be the first place to start in uh, in trying to model or to predict what the permeability would be of a blend of two uh, of two different materials and this is showing some data this is for a, um, a gas permeation um, through uh, a phase separated system consisting of uh, two, um, uh, two substituted acetylene polymers, uh, poly 1 trimethyl silyl propyne, we've seen before, uh, and one of its uh, structural relatives, poly 1 phenyl uh, 1 propyne. Uh, these materials um, uh, phase separate from one another, and the uh, permeation properties follow uh, pretty well the, uh, uh, this particular. Uh, empirical uh, model. Now there are other approaches to uh, to modeling uh, such uh, systems, and uh, we'll start to look a little bit at the uh, at the uh, uh, basic mathematical principles that can be used. Um, we recall that Fick um, postulated uh, his law of diffusion in analogy with Fourier's law of heat conduction and Ohm's law of electrical uh, conduction through uh, uh, through a resistive resistive element, and with that in mind, uh, when we have uh, different materials or materials with different transport properties that are mixed together or combined together in some way, uh, we can uh, use concepts from heat transfer and uh, from uh, uh, from uh, conduction of electricity to actually help model um, mass transfer in such systems. And so, for example, there are uh, two limiting um, theoretical models that describe how a, uh, uh, the transport properties of a blend of two materials um, can change with composition. And you can show without, uh, I won't go into uh, detail yet, but I'll show experimental data in a moment. You can show that the uh, permeation properties of a blend of uh, two materials has to always lie between the uh, limits uh, in transport that are shown on this uh, on this slide. Uh, one limit uh, for combining uh, two materials uh, in a blend would be simply to have a layer of one material labeled C in the left hand side uh, and then underneath it a layer of uh, the second material labeled uh, D and the transport being perpendicular to this. This would correspond to uh, mass transfer uh, resistance in series and uh, you can start from um, from Fick's law and derive the expression that's shown uh, below that that is that 1 over the uh, permeability of the blend is the uh, volume fraction of uh, material C divided by its permeability uh, and a similar term for uh, D. So this is one limit uh, if one has a, a, a blend of two materials, one limit for what the transport properties uh, can, uh, can be in that material. The other uh, limit is that uh, materials uh, C and D, uh, instead of being um, 
one on top of the other could be parallel to each other. And again, the flow uh, is then through the uh, through uh, both materials simultaneously. And in this parallel transport model, it's straightforward to derive that the permeability uh, of the blend is the volume fraction weighted permeabilities uh, of each component. And uh, any uh, other arrangement of the two materials, that is of these, uh, uh, of this phase separated blend, the transport properties will lie somewhere in between these, these two limits. And, and what this is headed for in just a moment is that the, uh, the organization, the transport properties through a uh, blend uh, depend upon the, uh, on the uh, organization of the, uh, uh, of the, the structure of the heterogeneous material. And as that structure changes, then the transport properties will change. Um, and so, uh, as indicated um, in the, the last slide, all heterogeneous materials will have uh, permeabilities that are uh, at least as large as the ones predicted by the series model and uh, no larger than that predicted by the, by the parallel models. And so, um, and, and typically, if uh, heterogeneous materials don't have such simple structures, their permeation properties will lie in between the results predicted by these, uh, these two models. Um, and we come back to the uh, uh, original picture from Bearer's paper showing uh, more complex uh, uh, dispersions of uh, uh, perhaps one um, polymer in another or a filler. Uh, in a, uh, in a polymer, and we want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what this kind of, these kinds of structures do to the uh, uh, transport properties. Um, there have been uh, models uh, derived for more complex situations than the ones that I've shown here, that is the series and parallel model. There have been models that have been derived to uh, more closely mimic the transport properties uh, through, for example, a, uh, uh, a uniform dispersion of spherical particles uh, in a matrix, uh, uniform dispersion of platelets, uh, rods, and so forth. And um, a couple of the uh, uh, well-known uh, models of this type are the so-called Maxwell model and the Brueggemann uh, model. Uh, the Maxwell model is, this is James Clerk Maxwell, the Maxwell of uh, from uh, uh, physics and, and who did a lot of work in uh, uh, modeling the, uh, uh, the uh, electrical conductivity of heterogeneous systems and in fact the uh, mass transfer analog of his uh, uh, electrical conductivity uh, studies is, is, is shown here. Um, and the Maxwell model is commonly used in the membrane literature to uh, to model the, uh, or at least as a first approximation, to model the uh, permeation properties of, for example, a zeolite dispersed uh, in a polymer. Um, and uh, here, the uh, permeability of the blend is written in terms of uh, P sub C. And in um, a, a heterogeneous material, there are um, there's a couple of different possibilities of how the um, of how the uh, heterogeneous phase uh, how the heterogeneities can be organized in the material. In each of the uh, uh, the cases that are shown in this particular graph, we see uh, small inclusions of a, uh, for example, uh, a polymer or an inorganic filler in a uh, in a continuous matrix, and the uh, uh, the transport properties in that heterogeneous system are written in terms of the permeability of the continuous phase. And so P sub C uh, is going to be the uh, permeability of the continuous phase. That is, uh, in the case of uh, uh, B, the continuous phase is the background um, for these, uh, for these uh, aggregated uh, pearl necklace-like uh, spheres. Uh, and the continuous phase is the one that the penetrant molecules can uh, can go across completely across this uh, material without ever having to transport uh, through or across the uh, uh, the inclusions or these aggregated spheres. 
On the other hand, the discontinuous phase in this case would be the uh, uh, would be the aggregated spheres or the platelets uh, down in C or the rods here. And so these models are always written in terms of the permeation properties of the continuous phase and that of the uh, discontinuous phase. Um, and so the Maxwell model uh, describes uh, the permeability of blend in terms of the permeability of the, of the uh, continuous phase material, the permeability of the dispersed phase, and then the volume fraction of the uh, dispersed phase. The Brueggemann model is a, um, is a uh, modified form of the uh, Maxwell model and uh, it is, describes blend uh, or composite permeabilities in terms of uh, the same variables as the Maxwell model does. Um, and so uh, originally the Maxwell model was used in uh, systems where the dispersed phase had a low volume fraction of uh, spherical uh, particles. Uh, John Petropoulos uh, has written a, a comprehensive review of transport in uh, heterogeneous media and so if you're, uh, if you're interested in reading more, uh, this, I think this uh, article is, uh, or book chapter is available for you. Um, the uh, Brueggemann model was uh, corresponding to random packing of, of dispersed iso isometric particles like spheres. Um, and so each of these models have, uh, have a slightly different uh, or somewhat different predictions for the permeability of the blend because they make different assumptions about the dispersion of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, filler or the, the, the dispersed phase. Um, to give you an idea of how the um, how these uh, properties or these models apply to experimental data. This is showing the, uh, uh, the permeation properties of uh, nitrogen through a blend of the two polymers we mentioned before that are phase separated, that is PTMSP and polyphenol propine. These are the ones that you'll remember uh, fit this empirical model uh, fine. Uh, but this doesn't give us any insight into the um, into the nature, the, the uh, structural uh, structurally heterogeneous nature of the uh, uh, of the blend. And so, coming back and and looking at the data more closely with models like the Maxwell and Brueggemann model will uh, give us a different picture of the or more complete picture of the morphology of um, of this uh, phase separated blend. And what's being plotted here is the permeability of nitrogen, for example, in the blend relative to its permeability in uh, PTMSP. Uh, that's the more permeable polymer in this pair of uh, PTMSP and, and polyphenylpropine. And the volume fraction of polyphenylpropine is starting at zero and going up to about 10% uh, in this case. So uh, at zero, a volume fraction polyphenylpropine this means that the uh, uh, this is permeation properties of uh, pure PTMSP with no uh, no P polyphenylpropine in it. Permeabilities are normalized to that, and what you can see is that at very low uh, volume fraction, that uh, the uh, permeability properties uh, for this uh, first uh, point follows um, the uh, Maxwell and and Brueggemann. Uh, models, they give essentially the same prediction uh, at this low volume fraction. Uh, when uh, PTMSP is taken to be the uh, uh, continuous phase and uh, shortly thereafter the, uh, at that somewhat higher volume fraction of polyphenylpropine you start to see a marked deviation from uh, the Maxwell and Bergerman model uh, where PTMSP is presumed to be uh, continuous. And the red dashed line is showing the Brueggemann model uh, for the case where now the polyphenylpropine is continuous and the Maxwell uh, model for that case uh, is shown here. And so what these data uh, start to tell us is that even at very low volume fractions uh, there is a, uh, uh, an inversion in the phase of this uh, heterogeneous material and the polyphenylpropine actually starts to become the, uh, the continuous phase. Um, if you look over a uh, broader composition range all the way out to, um, all the way out to pure polyphenylpropine, uh, uh, what you find is that the data are uh, very well, uh, are much better represented uh, 
um, by a model which assumes that the polyphenylpropyne uh, is actually the continuous phase um, rather than the, uh, uh, the PTMSP despite the fact that at low compositions on the left hand side of this uh, graph at low compositions of polyphenylpropyne this material is mainly uh, PTMSP and this brings about a uh, another concept in the uh, uh, transport in, in heterophase or heterogeneous materials and that is the fact that um, one component uh, or the other uh, may be the continuous phase so you can imagine if you have a blend of two polymers say A and B uh, when the, the blend is all polymer A then of course the um, that's the continuous phase is A and likewise when it's B the continuous phase is B. Uh, when there's a mixture of the two uh, depending on the composition and the uh, and the morphology uh, the uh, uh, the blend can be continuous in either A or B or in some cases uh, both um, so that would correspond to a co-continuous morphology. If you look at the simplest case um, this uh, parallel transport model, if, this, if these uh, uh, C and, and uh, D correspond to, uh, to two different polymers, this would be a case of co-continuous transport. That is, both um, the, uh, the gray phase and the, and the white phase are continuous and span, uh, and span the sample. And depending upon the morphology, uh, that can be the case in uh, more complex uh, mixtures uh, as well. And so um, the, uh, uh, a consequence of this is that you can imagine, uh, for example, that uh, in this case PTMSP is uh, more than uh, two orders of magnitude, almost three orders of magnitude more permeable uh, to nitrogen than, uh, than is uh, polyphenylpropyne. As a result of this, it would be easy to imagine um, that the uh, select uh, selectivity of uh, polyphenylpropyne since it's so much less permeable and there is this permeability selectivity trade-off uh, rule that the selectivity of the polyphenylpropyne uh, to a gas pair like oxygen over nitrogen would be higher for the polyphenylpropyne than it would be for PTMSP. And so uh, one can uh, see uh, how the selectivity varies uh, as the concentration of, uh, for example, polyphenylpropyne in this blend uh, varies across the composition range. Um, on the left hand side is, uh, uh, is the uh, PTMSP and it has very high permeability and low selectivity, only about 1.5 selectivity for oxygen over nitrogen. And as the um, as the concentration of uh, the polyphenylpropyne increases, the permeability of oxygen goes, uh, goes down dramatically. This is a log scale on the right hand side. And you see the selectivity stay near that of PTMSP and then at a uh, weight, uh, weight fraction now of about uh, 20 weight percent, you see the selectivity change dramatically up to values that are about those of the polyphenylpropyne. And what this is indicating uh, is the, uh, that there is a, a phase inversion underway. Uh, at the very lowest concentration of polyphenylpropyne in PTMSP, this blend is phase separated and the polyphenylpropyne is present uh, as a discontinuous uh, phase uh, in the PTMSP. You might envision it uh, a bit like it turns out it's a bit like uh, there are polyphenylpropyne platelets dispersed in a in a background matrix of PTMSP and as a result of this the uh, gas permeation properties um, are dictated basically by the permeation properties of PTMSP uh, at about 20 weight percent you see a, a large increase in selectivity and this is the point where uh, this uh, this uh, blend phase inverts and at, uh, uh, at compositions uh, at least from 50 weight percent on to 100 weight percent there's almost no change in selectivity and this indicates uh, the region where the blend is now uh, continuous in polyphenylpropyne and PTMSP is a uh, dispersed component uh, in, that, 
uh, in that continuous uh, matrix. Uh, the step change in selectivity is often uh, a, uh, a strong marker for, uh, for phase inversion in phase separated systems. And uh, it's often about as sensitive a marker of that as, uh, as you'll see. And so uh, this slide is just making the, uh, uh, the argument that if you go back to, um, back to the uh, uh, Maxwell model or the Brueggemann model and, uh, and plug in the, uh, uh, the, um, the idea that the, that the uh, uh, material is continuous in, in one phase or the other, that you will uh, derive, you can derive the result that the selectivity uh, is governed by uh, the uh, selectivity of the continuous phase, so the selectivity over two gases, or two gases, A over B, say oxygen over nitrogen, is equal to the ratio of permeabilities of uh, oxygen over nitrogen in the, the polymer that's the, continuous, uh, that's the continuous phase. And when you see a step change in the selectivity, that shows you're going through a, uh, going through a phase inversion. Materials going, in this case, from being continuous in PTMSP to being continuous in polyphenol uh, propyne. The, um, the point uh, at which this occurs in terms of composition, uh, this phase inversion can depend on processing history, uh, the nature of the polymers, and, uh, and many other factors. Um, now, the, uh, uh, the data uh, are consistent with there being a phase inversion in the range of about, in this particular case, about 5 to 20 weight percent uh, polyphenylpropyne. Uh, and in the, uh, uh, in the intervening uh, region, uh, one likely has a co-continuous structure where both PTMSP and uh, polyphenylpropyne are, uh, uh, are uh, connected in, um, in their domains and span the entire sample so that uh, penetrants can go uh, separately through a pure uh, polyphenylpropyne phase or through a, a pure PTMSP uh, phase. The Brueggemann model, like the Maxwell model, will also show uh, the, same, uh, the same sort of prediction that uh, uh, the selectivity can be dominated by the uh, uh, selectivity of the continuous phase. Another uh, example of this is shown in the work of uh, Ronby and, and Schur. Um, and they studied uh, blends of uh, polyvinyl chloride and polyethylene covinyl acetate. Um, these uh, uh, blends are, uh, are also phase separated, and they observed uh, that the, uh, uh, as they increase the uh, concentration of polyethylene vinyl acetate, or PIVA, in these blends, the, uh, the permeability uh, went up by a couple of orders of magnitude, uh, and the selectivity uh, underwent a, a dramatic uh, step change at about uh, 20 weight percent of the polyethylene vinyl uh, acetate. Uh, they went on to um, study these uh, blends by a variety of other techniques, as detailed on the, the right-hand side of the slide, and to show that even at at low compositions of polyethylene vinyl acetate, that one could have uh, one could have uh, phase inversion in these uh, blends. And so, another um, model that is used to describe transport and heterophase materials is the uh, generalized Maxwell uh, model. So the original Maxwell model is typically um, taken to apply to uh, spherical disper dispersion of particles uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a polymer matrix. Um, the modification of the Maxwell model introduces a, a geometric factor uh, G, and uh, this gives a, uh, uh, a measure for the, uh, uh, the uh, effect of the shape of the uh, dispersed uh, particles on, uh, on transport properties. Um, the original Maxwell model is recovered when G is equal to 2, that's for spherical particles, and uh, when G is equal to 1, uh, this corresponds to long uh, cylindrical particles that are oriented uh, transverse to the gas flow. Uh, other values of uh, G, um, uh, such as G being equal to 0, is, uh, corresponds to uh, a, a laminate structure that's oriented perpendicular to transport. 
and uh, g being equal to infinity corresponds to a laminated structure where the laminates are, are oriented parallel. Uh, and you could imagine <coughs> that if these uh, platelets or laminates are, um, are impermeable or much less permeable than the continuous matrix, then whether they would be oriented parallel or perpendicular to the direction of transport could have a significant bearing on what the permeability of that uh, blend was, even at the same uh, volume fraction of this uh, uh, dispersed phase, one could have very different permeabilities depending on the, the uh, platelet or, or laminate uh, orientation. Um, the, uh, uh, there are a number uh, of models of uh, uh, transport in such heterogeneous materials. Um, typically, the solubility behaves rather uh, simply, that is, as a, uh, a weighted average uh, of the uh, amount of each component and uh, and the uh, uh, and the uh, uh, solubility of, of the penetrant in in those components, the diffusion coefficient, um, however, also depends on shape, orientation, and connectivity, and this is why the permeability then in turn depends on shape, orientation, and connectivity of the uh, uh, of the components in a, a in a heterogeneous material. Um, and uh, as we've seen uh, previously, selectivity can be a very sensitive indicator of which phase is, uh, is continuous. Um, as we wrap up our discussion of the uh, basic phenomena of uh, transport in polymers, there are just a few um, other phenomena that I want to uh, go over very briefly uh, so that you're aware of them as you, as you go through the literature and in your uh, and in your work. Uh, one is the effect of cross-linking on uh, transport, transport properties. There uh, are a, uh, uh, many reports in the literature of uh, transport through cross-link systems. This is uh, uh, state-of-the-art desalination membranes are cross-linked. Many polymers used in controlled uh, drug delivery are cross-linked. Hydrogels used in biomedical applications are cross-linked. Um, there are uh, polymers that are used in gas separations are cross-linked. And so the nature of the uh, cross-linking and its impact on uh, transport properties uh, has been a part of this field uh, since the very beginning. And uh, these uh, data shown uh, here are from uh, Bearer uh, in the uh, 1940s and uh, the, they're showing the uh, uh, permeability and diffusion coefficients of uh, various gases through uh, natural rubber. Now, um, natural rubber is used in, uh, for example, in automobile uh, tires, and so the transport of gases through natural rubber uh, has been of interest for some time. It is uh, a cross-linked material, and so the effect of uh, cross-linking is important, and at least in the tire application, it's also uh, loaded with uh, carbon black uh, uh, nanofillers, and so um, the transport through, um, through the wall of your car tire is uh, transport through a heterogeneous material that can be modeled using um, some of the models that we just discussed in the last few slides. Uh, the traditional way that, uh, that natural rubber or polycysisoprene would be cross-linked is by um, mixing it with uh, sulfur and then heating it. This is the process that uh, Goodyear used uh, to first make uh, rubber for uh, car tires um, a, a, uh, um, nearly two centuries ago. Uh, and so what's being shown in this slide is the uh, permeability of natural rubber as a function of the uh, sulfur content. And uh, as the sulfur content uh, increases, permeability goes down. And what's implied by this is uh, that um, the natural rubber would be blended with various amounts of sulfur and then heated for the sulfur to react with the uh, uh, double bonds in, that are remaining in the isoprene uh, and cross-link the structure that way. If you remember and look back to the um, uh, original Flory Raynard paper um, describing the thermodynamics of uh, solvent uptake in cross-linked polymers, uh, Flory was uh, concerned with exactly this problem when modeling uh, 
the thermodynamics of uh, rubber that had been uh, cross-linked with, uh, with sulfur. Uh, what you, what uh, Bear and Skirau found is that the permeability goes down uh, significantly as the cross-linking uh, density goes up or as the sulfur content goes up. And this is largely due to a decrease in uh, diffusion coefficients. There's little uh, or no impact on gas solubility. The, uh, the uh, general uh, discussion in a lot of the literature is that cross-linking uh, de decreases penetrant diffusion and transport phenomena um, by uh, inhibiting uh, chain motion and decreasing diffusivity. Uh, and in the case of natural rubber, that in fact is the case, um, but it's not always the case. And this is uh, uh, something that I want you to be uh, aware of, particularly as you work on things like hydrogels um, and uh, materials where the cross links are, uh, are rather far apart from one another. And uh, the, the issue is that in the, in the case we, we saw uh, on the previous slide, that is with natural rubber, uh, as the sulfur content increases, the glass transition temperature uh, goes up uh, by close to 100 degrees C. This is the phenomena that, uh, that basically uh, Goodyear was after by making the natural rubber, turning it from a, a soft, gooey uh, material into a hard rubber. Um, what you know was accompanying that transition in mechanical properties was an enormous transition in glass transition temperature, and you could imagine that as the glass transition temperature went up this much, then that would uh, readily uh, accompany a uh, um, a, a decrease in, in chain motion and a decrease in in uh, a decrease in uh, uh, diffusion coefficients and therefore permeability. Now, we'll look at, at an exception uh, to this rule, and this is one in which the cross-linking doesn't reduce the chain motion, then uh, in this case it doesn't necessarily reduce permeability. And so <coughs> the uh, material we'll look at is uh, one that we've, um, that I've shown you uh, before in, uh, uh, in the, some of the lectures, and that is uh, one that we call cross-link peg or uh, XL, uh, PEO, XL for cross-link. <coughs> and uh, these materials are made by uh, cross-linking or by using a cross-linker, that is an, uh, a molecule that has two, uh, an acrylate unit on each end. This is a diacrylate, so we call it polyethylene oxide diacrylate or polyethylene glycol uh, diacrylate. Uh, and one can polymerize just the uh, cross-linker by itself to get a, uh, uh, to make a membrane. Um, <clears throat> these are, uh, are used in the biomedical field. They're also used in uh, gas separation field for uh, uh, polar uh, gas separations like H2S removal from natural gas. Um, you can also uh, put in um, monomers like uh, this polyethylene glycol uh, methyl ether acrylate or polyethylene glycol acrylate and make copolymers of these uh, materials uh, where this uh, um, uh, monomer, uh, either the, the PEG-MEA or PEG-A, forms a dangling uh, side chain and it's cross-linked by the polyethylene glycol uh, diacrylate. We showed two variants of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, side chain material, one with a methyl group here and the other with a hydroxyl uh, with an OH on the end. It turns out there's significant difference in properties depending on whether uh, these components in the polymer are tipped with a nonpolar methyl group or with a polar uh, hydroxyl group, and we'll get to that in a moment. Um, the types of network structures that can be formed are uh, in such a system. If we just uh, uh, cross-link the, uh, or just polymerize the cross-link or the peg diacrylate, one can form a network structure that is, uh, that is regular, uh, as shown in A. However, um, there are also possibility to, to form uh, defects. Uh, one would be where uh, the, uh, where the, uh, the cross-linker, as it's uh, polymerizing, uh, instead of 
cross-linking uh, with another chain, it basically uh, reacts with itself and forms like uh, what's called a loop, and that would be a uh, wasted cross-link. Uh, there can also be entanglements formed um, uh, between uh, the uh, uh, cross-links connecting various chains, and that can um, represent a permanent entanglement because the, the, uh, uh, of the cross-linking. And uh, as a result of this, one can change the, the structure of these networks um, by, uh, by varying the conditions under which they are, uh, under which they're polymerized, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, the first uh, thing that I'd like to, to show you is a mechanical property uh, data showing uh, copolymers that have been uh, prepared uh, with uh, just the um, with just polymerizing the diacrylate or the crosslinker. Uh, these are all rubbery materials um, with glass transition temperature below, well below ambient. They're flexible, uh, squishy uh, uh, membranes. And uh, what's being shown here is that as the concentration of the uh, crosslinker, that is the peg diacrylate, which is uh, the material that's shown at the top of this slide, as the composition of the crosslinker uh, decreases, the uh, mechanical uh, properties, the modulus, uh, goes down. And this reflects a decrease in uh, crosslinking density. <coughs> the way that the uh, crosslinker content is decreasing is being brought about uh, in three different ways in this graph. The first is by mixing the crosslinker, the peg DA, with the peg methyl ether acrylate. That's the first uh, monomer shown here. Uh, this uh, monomer, because it doesn't have two double bonds in it, um, cannot undergo crosslinking. And so the more of this material is in the uh, mixture that's used to make the copolymer, the lower is the crosslink density and the lower is the modulus of the material. And it turns out that this modulus is proportional uh, to the crosslink density of the material. Um, the little, uh, the blue triangles represent the same um, sort of copolymer, but now polymerized with the other, uh, uh, with the other uh, monomer that has the hydroxyl group on the end. Uh, one that's interesting is uh, these open circles uh, where it says uh, peg DA and water. And this represents the case where the uh, uh, polymerization is made with a uh, a mixture of the polyethylene glycol diacrylate and uh, water. It turns out, as you might imagine, uh, polyethylene oxide is highly soluble in water, and these um, uh, and these uh, uh, monomers and crosslinkers are also soluble in water. So you can dissolve the peg DA, for example, uh, in water and conduct the polymerization in water. And when you do that, uh, what you find is that the resulting uh, polymer after you dry the water out of it. Um, now it's 100% peg DA, but because the polymerization was carried out in various amounts of uh, water, the crosslinks didn't form uh, the same way as they would if there was no water there at all. And that gets back to this idea that depending upon the conditions of polymerization, we can form a more regular crosslink structure or one that has a lot of, of wasted crosslinks or loops. And the, the idea is that the more water uh, or uh, co-monomer there is in these mixtures, the lower is the cross-link density. And you can see that you, you lower the cross-link density as indicated by the uh, modulus of the material um, almost the same way whether you're, um, whether you're diluting the cross-linker with water or with either of these uh, two monomers. Now, uh, if you come back to the original picture by Bearer, uh, with the sulfur cross-linking in natural rubber, there was an enormous change in glass transition temperature as the cross-linking density changed. And so um, we can look at that uh, for this case uh, as well. So the sample that's most highly cross-linked is the one that's made uh, entirely 100% from the diacrylate, 100% cross-linker. And that material has a Tg of about minus uh, 40 um, degrees C. Uh, as uh, you dilute that, uh, uh, that cross-linker down with water and reduce the cross-link density, it barely moves the glass transition temperature. So unlike the case of natural rubber, um, 
this is a situation where even though the cross-link density is going down, the glass transition temperature is barely moving. Uh, in the natural rubber case, as you're introducing those sulfur cross-links, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, TG would be changing by, uh, uh, by more than 100 degrees C as you went from less cross-link to more cross-link. Here, um, the fact that this material uh, that you can uh, dilute out the, uh, the cross-linker with water when it's polymerized and really uh, drive the modulus and therefore cross-linking density to very low levels, um, and have the glass transition temperature not change means that the molecular motions that are giving rise to the glass transition temperature are occurring on a scale that is, uh, that is shorter than any of the relevant link scales for distances between cross-links. Um, similarly, for copolymerizing the cross-linker, the PEG-DA, with the uh, PEG um, with the PEG acrylate, which has the hydroxyl groups on the end, shows very little uh, decrease in, uh, uh, in glass transition temperature as well. Uh, on the other hand, if you put this one in, the one with the methyl ether end group on it, and now uh, change the, uh, the composition, putting more and more of that methyl ether acrylate into the polymerization mixture, you see the glass transition temperature go down and down. And uh, the way this is interpreted is that these side chains are highly flexible. These um, uh, nonpolar uh, side chains, when they, are, uh, when they are in this polymer matrix, they bring a lot of additional uh, motion. That motion creates free volume, uh, which has an impact on the transport properties. But that molecular motion also drives the glass transition temperature down. On the other hand, with this polar uh, end group, uh, this group is very likely interacting uh, via hydrogen bonding with a lot of the other polar groups that are in this polymer matrix and as a result these, this side group is much less mobile than this one. The decrease in glass transition temperature is much less for the PEG acrylate than the PEG uh, methyl ether acrylate. Now with this change in glass transition temperature you can imagine what that would do uh, to the transport properties and so this is showing uh, first carbon dioxide transport. Uh, for the case where the TG didn't change very much, that is the molecular motion didn't uh, change very much across this composition range, uh, there's virtually no change in transport properties. Um, and this is counter to the case that we saw with bearer and, uh, and uh, sulfur cross-linked natural rubber. As the cross-link density there went up, permeability properties went down by, um, by close to 100 fold in some cases. Here, as the cross-link density changes, um, it goes higher and higher as you go right to left, um, virtually no change in, in transport properties. And again, this is showing that uh, one effect of uh, uh, that cross-linking really uh, doesn't have much effect on transport properties if it doesn't uh, change the uh, rates of molecular motion. Um, on the other hand, in the case where uh, we've copolymerized with a uh, more mobile uh, co-monomer, this uh, PEG uh, methyl ether acrylate, now as the glass transition temperature goes down, uh, there's more and more chain mobility in this matrix. Permeability goes up by a factor of five. All of these materials have essentially the same uh, chemical composition. If you pick the, uh, for example, uh, this, uh, uh, Crosslinker has 14 ethylene oxide units, uh, and then the, the monomers are chosen to have about seven or eight uh, ethylene oxide units, so they're about half of this uh, guy. And so there's the, all of these materials have about 82% uh, percent by weight of uh, ethylene oxide units, so any of these changes are not due to chemical composition. It's really due to changes in the network topology and the network uh, mobility. Um, in addition, uh, selectivity uh, also changes, and in the case where the glass transition temperature was changed uh, very little uh, due to changing the uh, polymerization conditions, um, you see very little change in selectivity. In the case where, uh, where the glass transition temperature changed, molecular mobility changed, uh, then uh, the uh, selectivity uh, changes as well. Uh, another phenomena that um, you often find 
um, asked about is the effect of uh, molecular weight on uh, transport parameters in polymers. And if you go to the, the uh, uh, membrane literature, you'll find that there are many cases where the, um, uh, there's essentially no report of the effect of uh, uh, molecular weight on, on transport uh, properties. There are um, probably thousands, or if not tens of thousands, of papers now in the Journal of Membrane Science where uh, permeation or diffusion properties are reported in uh, polymers, uh, and there's no indication of the molecular weight of the, of the polymer. And while molecular weight can have a profound impact on properties like uh, mechanical properties, viscosity, and so forth, it turns out it has uh, only uh, uh, a small effect on, uh, on transport properties, and that's why it's often not even reported. Um, so what's shown here is the uh, oxygen diffusion coefficient in polystyrene as a function of a molecular weight of polystyrene, number average molecular weight. And what you can see is that the oxygen diffusion coefficient decreases some, uh, less than a factor of two, and uh, then uh, essentially becomes independent of molecular weight. And what's going on here is at uh, low molecular weight, uh, a polymer will have a lot of uh, chain ends. The lower the molecular weight is, the more chain ends it has per unit uh, per unit volume, per, for example, those chain ends tend to be more mobile than in chain segments that are in the that are in the interior or middle of the polymer chain, simply because the seg segments of the chain that are in the middle uh, are bound by covalent bonds to monomers on either side. And once you get out to the chain ends, uh, they're only bound to the polymer chain uh, on one side of the uh, on one side of that last monomer, and so the chain ends in polymers tend to be more mobile in the interior um, uh, chain elements. And when you have more chain ends, uh, then uh, you have a more mobile matrix and um, transport properties like diffusion are faster. However, uh, by the time most uh, polymers get to a molecular weight where it is uh, possible to make uh, uh, mechanically stable freestanding films, you're out of this regime where the transport properties depend on molecular weight and you're over in this regime where the transport properties are independent of molecular weight. And so this is why in, in a lot of the literature you don't see people emphasizing molecular weight or, or in some cases even reporting the molecular weight of the polymer that they're studying uh, because it, um, the molecular weights are, are generally always in a range where, um, where molecular weight has uh, almost no impact on uh, uh, transport properties. Um, this is uh, showing a graph of uh, correlation between um, uh, transport properties, uh, both permeability and diffusion coefficients in the glass transition uh, temperature for a number of uh, rubbery polymers and is making the point that the more rigid or stiff the polymer chain is, uh, the lower is the diffusion coefficient and and therefore lower is uh, permeability. Now these data could also likely be highly correlated with free volume because uh, free volume will typically go hand in hand uh, with chain stiffness. As you go to higher glass transition temperature materials, um, the free volume would change accordingly to, uh, to change the transport properties. Um, the inclusion of uh, polar groups on the backbone of a, a polymer can have a profound in, uh, impact on their transport properties. Uh, this is showing a very early work uh, by Van Amaranjan on uh, uh, the effect of acrylonitrile groups, that's C triple bonded to N, uh, very highly polar groups, the effect of inclusion of uh, more and more uh, acrylonitrile into uh, copolymers with butadiene, with butadiene being um, almost uh, nonpolar. And uh, what Van Amaranjan found was that as the acrylonitrile content increased, the uh, glass transition temperature went up, chain mobility um, slowed down, the materials got more dense, free volume went down, and diffusion coefficients of uh, penetrance went down, uh, as did uh, permeability. So the the effect of uh, introducing polar groups into 
uh, polymers often increases the cohesive energy density of the polymer, often increases chain packing, can uh, reduce molecular mobility, and uh, can slow down, uh, slow down transport. Um, the, uh, the impact of uh, uh, concentration on diffusion coefficients is shown here uh, for a, uh, a variety of phenomena that, uh, that are, that's observed um, in the field or in the literature. Uh, we've uh, taken uh, and treated diffusion coefficients often uh, so far in the course as if, they're, um, as if they are uh, constant. Um, however, in many cases, as, um, um, as the penetrant concentration in a polymer changes, the diffusion coefficient will change as well. And this is largely occurring because um, penetrants can, uh, as they dissolve into polymers, as we've seen earlier, they can swell polymers, and this can have impacts on their, um, on the, uh, uh, on the polymer chain motion and, and therefore uh, transport. And we'll just step through these, uh, these th uh, four regimes very briefly over the next, uh, the next couple slides. Um, one uh, thing that I'll note about the uh, so-called dual mode model, which is for um, transport in, uh, uh, in uh, gas transport, small molecule transport in, in uh, uh, glassy polymers, is that uh, it postulates, uh, we've, we've already seen the solubility model uh, where we postulate Henry's law and, uh, and Langmuir uh, modes for uh, solubility. This is what gives the sorption isotherms their uh, concave appearance uh, in the uh, uh, relative to the pressure axis. There is a transport model that goes with that and I'll just uh, present it very briefly here and it uh, presupposes that uh, that the uh, uh, flux of penetrant through, uh, through a glassy polymer also consists of two components. One is flux through these Henry's Law or so-called dissolved uh, gas regions and a flux through the Langmuir uh, regions. Um, and uh, each of these uh, modes, Langmuir or Henry's Law and Langmuir mode can have uh, different diffusion coefficients in this particular model. Um, one can, uh, can uh, integrate the, uh, the general flux expression. I won't go into uh, all of the details. This is just to show you how models like this are, are set up where there are multiple, uh, multiple uh, directions or multiple pathways for transport through a material. And the, uh, the bottom line for uh, steady state transport, that is permeability, which is uh, uh, the um, uh, flux through uh, membrane times the thickness divided by the pressure difference that brings about that um, brings about that transport, and there's a typo here uh, on the right-hand side. This uh, P2 should be uh, P1, um, and so this is the general expression for uh, permeability of a gas uh, through a polymer uh, under the uh, uh, under the uh, dual mode um, assumption. Uh, KD, as you'll remember, is the Henry's Law coefficient. DD is the diffusion coefficient through the Henry's Law regions. CH prime is the Langmuir capacity parameter. DH is the diffusion coefficient through the Langmuir sites. And B is the Langmuir uh, affinity parameter. Uh, very typically, the experiments are organized so, such that the downstream pressure should be P1 on the right-hand side here. But again, that's a typo. Uh, is uh, very low. And so the way you'll find the dual mode model uh, expressed for transport properties expressed in the literature is shown here. Where again, KD is the uh, is the uh, Henry's law coefficient. DD is the diffusion coefficient through the Henry's law region, and uh, these parameters uh, F and K uh, represent the ratios that are that are shown here. Um, show one example of uh, gas transport data fit to the dual mode model, and this is how you can get. Uh, uh, permeabilities that decrease within, with increasing pressure, uh, and it reflects the, uh, uh, as the pressure uh, increases, more of the gas molecules are in the Henry's Law mode uh, and relative to the Langmuir mode, and they have different mobilities, and so uh, as the solubility, both solubility and diffusion coefficients are changing as uh, pressure changes in this case. Um, one can average diffusion coefficients um, in this particular model, and the way that the average diffusion coefficients calculated uh, for this or any model uh, 
uh, in fact, is, uh, is shown here. Um, I won't belabor this point uh, for the time being, um, except to show you the, uh, some um, indication of uh, how this uh, model has been expanded or extended to uh, predict permeability in uh, mixtures and what these mixture effects uh, can be. Um, so for example, uh, this is showing CO2 permeability as a function of pressure in, uh, in a uh, glassy uh, polymer. And so the pure CO2 permeability uh, decreases with pressure as shown here. Uh, with just a, a low level of, uh, uh, of a second component, in this case isopentane, the diffusion or the permeation uh, of the CO2 is actually suppressed. And so uh, putting low levels of highly condensable penetrants that fill the Langmuir sites uh, in a polymer can actually depress the permeability of, uh, uh, of lighter gases like CO2. Um, this is also uh, shown uh, for another case here uh, for showing oxygen permeability as a function of relative humidity uh, for a, uh, an, a polyamide material. Uh, this is important because this uh, cellar polyamide is used for, um, for oxygen barrier in uh, food packaging and um, in many cases for high barrier, uh, high barrier uh, materials for food packaging actually become much more permeable uh, to oxygen as relative humidity goes up and cellar um, uh, actually sees its permeability uh, go down with relative humidity. And this is exactly the same effect as was shown here. That is low levels of a highly condensable component like water uh, gets into the non-equilibrium excess volume of cell R, basically fills up the Langmuir sites and that in, uh, then prevents uh, or inhibits oxygen from being transported through this material. Uh, and this was used as a marketing point for this particular uh, material. Um, these second component effects can be actually quite large. Um, in very open materials like poly 1-trimethylsilylpropyne, um, which have a large free volume and therefore very high Langmuir capacity, um, as the uh, uh, content in this case, or uh, partial pressure of uh, butane, uh, increases, it really chokes the flow of, uh, of methane by uh, more than an order of magnitude at the uh, at low temperature where you get very strong sorption of butane and that really blocks the flow of methane through this material. Um, another example of the impact of humidity on gas permeation properties is shown, is shown here. Um, and this is a, a plot from the uh, barrier packaging literature, so food packaging uh, literature. And essentially it shows that in very um, nonpolar materials like high density polyethylene that sorb almost no water, that the uh, impact of humidity on, uh, on the permeability of other gases is, is negligible. Uh, in the cellar, the um, uh, permeability of oxygen actually goes down as uh, relative humidity goes up. This is because of these dual mode second component effects. And in uh, polyvinyl alcohol, and a copolymer of ethylene vinyl alcohol, which has about 30% ethylene in it, and the balance is, is polyvinyl is vinyl alcohol. Uh, the oxygen permeability goes up dramatically as uh, relative humidity uh, goes up. And this last case is of particular interest because polyvinyl alcohol is a dominant um, barrier material in barrier uh, in high barrier packaging for uh, things like uh, ketchup bottles. Uh, in other cases where uh, when packaging highly oxygen sensitive products, polyvinyl alcohol can't be melt processed the way uh, many packaging materials can, and so it's often copolymerized with ethylene uh, to make it melt processable. And so very typically in high barrier uh, applications, uh, it's using a thin layer of ethylene vinyl alcohol copolymer. The, uh, uh, one of the drawbacks of using uh, ethylene vinyl alcohol and polyvinyl alcohol is that it's very sensitive to moisture. As you might imagine, uh, polyvinyl alcohol itself would be uh, soluble in water. And so when it's exposed to uh, water, even at low levels uh, of humidity, uh, the polyvinyl alcohol will absorb a lot of water, so much so that it swells extensively 
and their increase in polymer chain motion, increase in free volume, and then there goes the diffusion and permeability uh, properties. And so the, the point of this is that in these uh, second component effects, um, that they can either be negligible uh, in the case of uh, where the components uh, both uh, sorb into the polymer at very low levels and the, you know, the oxygen and water are essentially permeating independently of one another. They can be in competition as in this glassy uh, material where uh, the presence of humidity actually uh, inhibits oxygen transport or uh, the presence of a second component can actually in, uh, can, can markedly change uh, the transport of other components as in the case of uh, the impact of relative humidity on oxygen transport through a highly hygroscopic um, polymer. Um, and so these are showing uh, just one more graph about, uh, about the effect of uh, transport, the effect of uh, pressure on uh, transport properties. And with that, I think uh, we're done for this uh, lecture. Thank you.